In this episode, I asked Kaya Hunter for simple remedies to common health issues like headaches, digestive issues, and achy joints from a traditional Chinese medicine approach. Welcome to the Flower Lounge, a place for conversations with wildly creative people and a little plant-loving wisdom to help you experience life in full bloom. I'm Katie Hess, flower alchemist and founder of Lotus Way, and I believe in a world where we're all living at our personal edge. Welcome to the Flower Lounge podcast. I am currently recording this in Singapore and I'm really excited to be talking to Kaya back home in Phoenix, who is our San Center in-house acupuncturist and traditional Chinese medicine specialist. Super lucky to have her in our lives professionally and personally. I know I have called you and texted you so many times while I've been in Asia. How are you doing, Kaya? I'm great. How are you? (laughs) <laughs> good um so like it's it's been funny so for the listeners just being in asia and having things pop up you know that, like it's normal when you're traveling right that different people in your traveling party will have health issues come up so i think i probably contacted you about like 10 times in the last couple yeah, of months something like that <laughs> <laughs> this is such a great resource to have and actually went to see a Chinese medicine doctor here to get herbs prescribed because a couple of us did who are traveling together because Chinese medicine is the way to go. Let's talk about Chinese medicine. Nice. Can't go wrong with Chinese medicine. So you're actually, let me throw in a question that I got from Marisha through social media, because I think that that'll be a great way to start. And she asked why traditional Chinese medicine training versus Western medicine, pros and cons. I believe she's in the Western medicine system. So she wanted to know pros and cons of training Chinese medicine versus Western medicine. Well, I mean, both are super helpful to have. When you go for Chinese medicine training, you get Western medical training. So we get both spectrums. So I learned pharmacology. I learned diagnosis type stuff, even though I can't legally diagnose. So you're going to get both. Um, when you go the Chinese medicine route. As far as why choose one over the other, it's personal philosophy. So I'm more of like nurturing the whole person versus looking at a symptom type of thing. Does that make sense, hopefully? Yeah, I mean, when you're talking about whole person, you mean also like caused this? How the systems work together. So we look at the physical, emotional, spiritual aspect in Chinese medicine, at least I do. And you have a lot of freedom in getting to the root. A lot of people talk about the root. And what that means is, what are you doing? What are you feeling that's causing your symptoms? Where traditional Western medicine, you're looking at what are the symptoms and how do we suppress it? So steroids, for instance, they are an immunosuppressant. But a lot of times, I mean, every time if you're sick, you need your immune system to take care of something. So for me, I'm like, why would I suppress the immune system when it needs to work properly? And there are times like in autoimmune conditions where the immune system is being a little wonky and you need to treat that. But again, like, why are we, why are we putting blocks in certain receptors? Like, why are we not trying to bring the the body back to balance? The body can heal itself. I mean, I can't heal it. The doctors can't heal it. It's your body and you're the only one who can heal it. Like the best doctor in the world can't heal a cut, only you can. So why not give the body what it needs to to heal instead of suppressing stuff? Hopefully that was a nice linear thought. Yeah, I mean, I tend to think of Western medicine as like amazing at broken bones, accidents, heart attacks. Yeah, for emergency situations, absolutely. Even, it's interesting because even one of the people that I'm traveling with, as you know, had a sort of like an urgent situation a couple of weeks ago. And even then, you know, once we figured out that it wasn't a heart attack, we went to the Chinese medicine doctor and that was a pretty acute, like extreme pain, cold sweats, you know, gripping the side of the couch, like for hours kind of ordeal, but 
you know, after taking the pulse and making sure it wasn't a heart issue, we went to the Chinese medicine doctor. And it's interesting here in Asia, people typically think of Chinese medicine as being, as working a little bit slower. So like in their minds, they think of Western medicine as like, it works really fast, right? You take a pill, it works. And Chinese medicine takes a few days to sort of like really balance out. But then you're, you're really getting to the root cause, right? Versus just suppressing a symptom, like you're saying. Yeah, getting to the root cause. As far as slow, I know you said they prefer herbs over there versus acupuncture. Acupuncture works really fast, almost immediately. I mean, definitely immediately. You put a needle in and the body responds. So it's kind of funny, the different mindsets for different parts of the world. And they're on point for heart attack, but still you should, you should go to the doctors. Like the pills will block that, that thing. Like I block the receptors, like I was telling you about, and that's really helpful. There's yeah, it's, it's great. Um, oh my God. Where is, where would you, where would... And then in terms of training, like, can you give us like a, you know, 10 point bullet list of like what's included in your training? So if for Marisha, she's curious, like what, what's included? Besides pharmacology and anatomy. Okay, so there's a lot included. Let me try to remember. So it's a four-year <laughs> program, and our training includes, you know, th- Chinese, like, I think there's four levels of Chinese medical theory. So there's four levels of that. There's learning acupuncture points. There's diagnosing from both Western and Chinese medical points of view. There are, let me think, there's like your typical signs, like um, how you would get tested in a Western sense, so like uh, muscle testing as far as rotator cuff and stuff like that, Um, tapping on the lungs, listening to the lungs, listening to the heart with a stethoscope, all that fun stuff. Um, Oriental medicine psychology, which is really fun. Oriental medicine physics. That was really cool too. And then a ton of clinical stuff. I mean, you're in the clinic from semester one, watching, observing people higher up than you. And then after you do that for half a year, a year, something like that, then you actually get to start working with people. And then we learn um, Chinese medical massage, Chinese herbs, Western herbs, cupping, gua sha, moxa. Like hopefully I'm listing everything. It's a lot of stuff. <laughs> Pathophysiology from the the Western sense, microbiology, um, all your basic pre med stuff. So yeah, anatomy and physiology, of course. Everything that has to do with the human body, we're learning it from both the Western and Eastern views. Lab reading. <laughs> I'm like, oh my god, I'm just learning more now. Yeah, it's really interesting. Like. Uh, it's interesting to me to watch or to see um, Chinese medicine clinics here in Singapore specifically, because there are so many of them. It's like, there's one in every, they call it like block. So like kind of like one in every neighborhood and they're open all day long, every day of the week, you can walk in and just like pull a number and you get to see the doctor and the doctors rotate every day. And then like I was telling you before, they typically start with herbs, I think just because people are maybe a little more squeamish of needles here. And even though they, you know, so the doctor said something about the needles being really effective. She was like, well, why don't you just try the herbs? Because I think she could tell there was a little bit of squeamishness in terms of needles. But a lot of the doctors are coming from China. So a lot of the doctors here have been trained in like Nanjing University. And then I have been practicing here for like you know, 10 years or whatever, but it's fascinating. And then they like, you know, you're, you sit with a doctor for like five, 10 minutes. So they're pretty short appointments, but pulse reading, tongue, blood pressure in some cases, and then you get the cerebral formula. It's a powder and it all gets mixed together and shoved into this machine that like spits up these little packets that you just pour into hot water twice a day. <laughs> Great. I love the idea of like a neighborhood healer you get to go to. Like how cool would it be if we just got to pop into our neighborhood healer whenever we needed it? Oh my God. It's awesome. Why do we not have that here? That's so cool. 
It's great. And it's super duper, duper, duper affordable. Oh my goodness. And you can get tweena and cupping and gua sha and all the other stuff. Um, yeah. And I, love the, I love the idea of the shorter appointments. I know traditionally with any natural health you see here in the States, it's like hours worth of appointments to get to the root. But what I have found is everybody's got their own story and their own subjectiveness to their health. But when you look at the body, it just tells you exactly what you need. So I actually prefer a shorter, like, what do you have going on? What's your goal? And then just let your body tell me what the root is versus trying to talk our way through it. Everything's in the pulse, right? Yeah, exactly. I mean, we can talk our, I've, (laughs) when you don't listen to the body and you listen to your patients, I saw this a lot in school, it was really funny where people would be treated, like I would see somebody who's seen like a ton of other people and they're like, my neck hurts. I have neck pain every day. Nothing, nothing is helping. Even like coming here, I'm not really getting relief. And I would go, okay, point to your pain. And like this lady pointed halfway down her back and she was calling it her neck and nobody had her point to her pain. So everybody was sitting there treating her neck versus like going down and treating where it was. So, so there's a, everybody has a different understanding of our, their own body and, and whatnot. And maybe her brain really did think it was her neck. Our brain isn't always right either. So it's kind of funny to, to have less talking is, I think it's, it's really helpful. So I know that you said on occasion that in your practice, the majority of the people that you see are one focus that you find emerging again and again through your work is that you're typically working with people that are looking to break habits or patterns of any kind. Mm -hmm. Can you give some examples of what that looks like or what you see? So I'm like, ooh, let's let's get into it. So we each have a story that was implanted when we were below seven or eight that runs our subconscious, which creates habits that create our current life. So everything from chronic pain to the way we eat to the way we think is just a habit. And for those of us who don't like the way our life has turned out, who don't like the way we feel, who just want to be healthier, it's, it's a matter of looking at what habits do you have in your daily life and how to break those. What are some of the examples. I mean, like if I think of habit, I think of habit forming, I think of like drinking, smoking, addiction. Right. Addiction. Yeah. But that's, that's not always it. Even, okay. So weight, a lot of people have issues with weight here in America. So what habits are creating your weight? What stories are creating your weight? A lot of that is it's hard to eat. I don't have time. And then we're focusing on, I can't lose weight. I'm fat. Those negative stories. And what happens is our brain will put a filter because our brain likes to be right. So if you're saying I have a hard time losing weight, guess what? Your brain's going to see more fast food joints than other people who don't have that story. And it's going to have different. It's like the Google filters. (laughs) Totally, totally. Your social media. Our brain does the same thing. (laughs) So yeah, it totally filters out our perspective. A fun exercise, which I did on our Facebook live talk earlier this week, is if you aren't driving and you're, you're sitting and looking around, like look for everything that's blue. What's blue around you? Look for blue. And if you close your eyes and I say, what was orange? You're going to be like, wait, what? But I was looking for blue, right? Where, wherever your attention is, is what you're going to find. So if your attention is on the fact that you can't lose weight, then your brain is going to filter everything else out and donuts are going to be all around you (laughs) or something like that. So what I do with acupuncture is we talk about your goal. If your goal is to lose weight, then cool. We change that story instead of I can't lose weight, I'm fat, whatever it is. We switch it to I maybe I want to be, I'm healthy. I'm a healthy person. I'm attracted to healthy things. And then I go through and use acupuncture to actually reroute the pathways in your brain and to help take those filters off. And that's where the flower essences, I think are just such a powerful combination with the acupuncture. I mean, using them together, it's like, all right, so we're going to, I'm going to reroute your brain with the acupuncture. Here are the flower essences your body needs to help that pattern get broken Every time you feel like you have that craving, 
or have that old story emerge, you take your drops, you spray yourself, you use your anointing oil, and we break that pattern. Love it. How has your practice been enhanced by working with flower essences? It's people get better so much faster and they're so happy. I love it. I mean, so just to walk you through the process of how I use the flower essences, I, when I have somebody come in, we talk about what goals they have. I kind of talk to them about their stories and what habits they want to break. And then I have them lay down on the table and actually check their pulses and then test them against different flower essence, essences. And then their pulses will immediately change immediately change so I can tell what needs to be brought into balance with acupuncture based on working with the flower essences so it's like muscle testing on steroids yeah it really is so the the flower essences will bring the pulses either all the way into balance or almost into balance if they don't bring them all the way into balance I know there's something physical that I need to reroute with acupuncture so I either support the flower essences with the acupuncture or I focus on the physical aspect that has a blockage and then use the anointing oils and mist to bring the rest of the meridians into balance. I know just from working with you personally that when you say like bringing pulses into balance, it sounds very kind of vague and vague, but when you're, you know, you're looking at lung, you're looking at you know, can you talk a little bit about what you're actually feeling yeah. for or maybe like one flower elixir in an experience you've had recently of something that it balanced out? Yeah. So pulses aren't like Western pulses. They, so we, we take them in the same place along the radial artery and the wrist. And what we're looking for is traditional Chinese pulses, which look at the lungs and the immune system, large intestine, I mean, every system in the body, stomach, spleen, heart, kidneys, adrenals, hormones type thing. And that's how we, that's what we use for diagnosis, that and the tongue and different veins and the way they look in the body. Um, so when I'm, what I'm doing is I'm looking for how stuck things are, how open things are. If everything's flowing properly, what's out of balance? What's causing what to be out of balance? So for instance, the heart um, takes care of the digestive system in Chinese medicine. So if the heart's really gunked up, I check the stomach and digestive system to see if there, there's something wrong there too. If there isn't, then it's a more acute case. If there's something wrong there too, and I'm like, okay, so this has been around for a while. And then when I put the flower essences on, I'm looking for change in the pulse. So there's an optimal position for each of the pulses. And that's what I'm looking for. I'm trying to bring everything back into the optimal position. So name one flower that recently you've worked with, with some patient of yours that, you know, that you could see some sort of change in their pulses. Yeah, so I usually get groupings of things, and I've gotten like a Boundless Wisdom, Fierce Compassion group lately. So Boundless Wisdom works with both the stomach and kidney pulse. So that's where a lot of undigested emotions and traumas take place, which makes sense with the Boundless Wisdom. And then Fierce Compassion is kind of like that anger and grief and just overall hardness that happens when we've been jaded in the world. And was, yeah, that, that completely changes people by the time they're off the table. And when you say you get groupings, are you talking about a phenomenon that I used to have with flower essence consultations when I was doing them was like, I would have three months worth of everybody had this issue. And then the next three months, everyone had this issue. Is that what you mean? Yeah. So groupings, it's just, everyone's coming in with the same thing. I used to get paranoid. I used to be like, oh my God, is this going to happen to me? Why is, is this a sign? It's just, there's like a <laughs> change in vibration out there or something. And everybody's like, I'm going to go get treated for this. I think that's just some like weird universal phenomenon. I was listening to a taxi driver talk the other day here in Singapore. And he was like, yeah, one, you know, some nights it's like all expats from, you know, UK and some nights it's like all the Indian passengers and other nights <laughs> <laughs> it's like, <laughs> All Vietnamese, like for some reason, it's just like this weird phenomenon that happens, right? <laughs> it's not just us. <laughs> so one question that comes to mind is for people who get headaches really often, what would you recommend to them? All right. So 
Generally speaking, I would say first let's look at your neck. How tight is your neck? Are you doing the whole computer thing where you're jutting your neck out forward? And is it causing a tension headache? Um, in Chinese medicine, we have different parts of the body correspond to different headaches. So digestive headache tends to be like the frontal, your forehead. That can also be like allergy issues too, if you have sinus pressure. Liver stuff tends to be at the very top of your head and gallbladder tends to be at the sides. And in the back, the occipital area where your neck connects to the back of the head, those tend to be like overworking kidney, adrenal, hormonal type stuff. So overall, like if you've got the neck tension, you're not quite sure what the headache causes, like for, I mean, I'm going to just say flower essences because those are so accessible. Quiet Mind would be really great. And this is where you can come into, but you can stretch your neck in every direction. So it's four directions each side. We have a super mobile neck and you have to hold <laughs> stretch for 20 seconds and put your Quiet Mind oil on that. And if that doesn't take care of it, then we have to look at, again, the root cause of it. Are you, do you have digestive issues? Do you notice if you eat something? Do you get a headache a day later, an hour later? Are you having allergy and sinus pressure that you need to take care of? Gallbladder stuff, are you having troubles making decisions? Are you, is there something along your entire body that's really tight? Like are your IT bands tight? And that's just reflecting all the way up to your head. Are you having what trouble? Are IT band? Oh, IT band. Oh, nice people don't know that. So that's the side of your thigh. It connects from your knee up to your hip. Make me break it down. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Liver, are you just overstressed? Are your eyes hurting and straining? Are you overworking again? That can kind of be that occipital thing. But stress, alcohol, too much greasy, fatty foods. Are your hormones jacked up? Are you not pooping? those types of things for the headache or the top of the head and then the back of the neck like are you not resting enough that one sucks i've i have a history of whiplash so i i know exactly what that occipital headache feels like for me working out the neck is what took care of it for me but also making sure i wasn't overworking as i would do double credits in school like i would do twice the amount that i was they recommended and i ran my own business so Oh, yeah. When there's a lot going on, your your body takes a toll. I know you've sent me diagrams through text of like the different fingers and which fingers you can massage for different areas. Mm -hmm. um, would you recommend to people if they get a headache to massage their hands? Yeah. So it's actually the middle knuckle. You can just grab the sides of the middle knuckle of any finger and put pressure on them for about 10 seconds and you'll notice a change. If you don't notice a change, just switch to the next finger. It's always going to be that middle joint. So that's the easiest way to describe that one. But 10 seconds, you should notice a shift. It may not completely get rid of it, but that's how you know whether or not you're on the right track. Speaking of joints, let's talk about joints. I know that being here in Asia and eating funky foods, I have gotten, you know, an inhumidity. I've gotten achy joints, like achy fingers. And I'm always trying to figure out like which food it was that created that. I think it's sugar. Now I'm like pretty sure it's sugar. <laughs> sugar will do that to you. I've also, but I've also cut out wheat. So what would you recommend to folks who occasionally experience achiness in their joints? I mean, geez, not to mention, you know, holding a smartphone is also probably yeah. going to lead to a lot of disasters in our culture. But just in general, what would you recommend for people with achy joints? So definitely check what you're doing on a daily basis. Are you typing a bunch? Are you on your phone a bunch? Um, I noticed that my fingers will flare up from typing too much and being on my phone too much, which is easy to do. So we want to make sure you're getting proper blood flow and just you can gently rub each finger joint. Um, you can just do some Tai Chi or Qigong or just gentle flowy movements with your hands. Don't hold them rigid. A lot of people will just hold them into a little ball with their fist or like put their fingers out straight or any joint really like just lock it up. And that's not helpful to do any of the Oh, Oh, question. Yeah. What are, what is your feeling about cracking? Oh my God. I have just been cracking my fingers like crazy on this trip. And you know, I know some people say like, uh, the old wives tale is like, if you crack your fingers a lot, you'll get arthritis. You have any thoughts about that? 
That's so funny. I've been cracking my fingers a lot too lately. And I'm like, why am I doing this? But they ache, so I naturally want to do it. If it hurts, if you're forcing it and it hurts, I wouldn't do it. But if you're just like- feels good. Cracks and it feels good, your body's not going to let you do something. It's, you know, it's going to hurt it. I have to show you when I get back, I found the coolest tool for massaging fingers. It looks like this little kind of like plastic crocodile like jaws, like with teeth. It, well, it's hard to explain with a little pull, like with the little wheels that roll. Anyway, you just like run it along your fingers and it massages both sides of your fingers. Oh, that sounds so nice. It's hard to explain, but it's a really nice little gadget for finger massage. <laughs> that sounds great. I'm like, I'm like right now. In the, in the East, they just like have so many cool gadgets for healing yourself. I think that's been like, like the thing that has really impressed me the most from being here is just seeing how many little exercises and gadgets and daily routines that people have to maintain their own health. You and know, that's from, what you have to do. From it's like the reflexology path. Oh, we just released, if you're listening, we just released this really fun movement video with some of those, ex, some of those like self-healing types of exercises on YouTube. Did you see it, Kaya? Not yet. Ah, oh I mentioned you in there. There's like whole body gua sha and <laughs> like these guys doing gua sha on their thighs on the, on the rails. It's just, it's really fascinating. Like my I've always loved Chinese medicine and it just being here has, it's just like, it's like expanded even more because I see like, like how it can be incorporated into like a way of life versus just when you're sick and you need to be treated for something really specific. It's really a way of life. What are some things that you incorporate into your life from traditional Chinese medicine or theory or practice that keep you healthy on a daily basis? Hmm. First of all, I have to say that comes back to all that comes back to habit. So taking care of themselves on a daily basis, that's a habit. And guess what? I bet they're feeling pretty good. How many older people have you met there that just like look amazing and they're like mm -hmm. more healthy than 20 year olds here. It's pretty crazy. Our habits will make or break us. As far as me, oh my gosh, what do I do? I mean, I definitely do a ton of acupuncture, gua sha. I do a lot of that until my neck doesn't hurt anymore, which is fabulous. I try to be mindful of as far as balancing the foods that I eat. I tend to crave dry, drier foods. So I have to be really mindful of that because I'm more, I live in the desert. I'm a dry out, dried out person. I need to incorporate some more moisture into my What's life. a dry food? Like a potato chip? Like, yeah, crackers, potato chips, like mainly processed stuff. Acrid stuff can be really drying. Garlic has some drying properties and I love garlic a lot. <laughs> gentle movement. So I actually, my joints don't respond well to really rigorous, intense movement. I need more like qi yang, tai chi, body weight type stuff. If I go too hard, my body falls apart. And here when people get into stuff, man, do they get into stuff. <laughs> they go really aggressive, which is fine if it works for you, but I don't know, man. Sometimes I see all the, the crazy exercises on Instagram and I'm like, oh my God, my knee joints are like, oh, don't ever do that. <laughs> <laughs> Reminds me of when we were in Taiwan and we met that guy in his 80s who looked like his body was like in his 20s. He just kind of laughed at us when he saw us running or jogging or sprinting. Like he just, he, <laughs> he was like, I don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> Good luck with your, your body. <laughs> it's like, especially in Taiwan, everything is so based around like growing internal chi. It's like everything is from the inside out. And so like, you don't need jogging and sprinting and high in intensity activities when you're, when you're working with your chi at that, at those levels. I yeah. find that so fascinating. It's such an interesting difference between East and West. <laughs> I think that's why I was so drawn to Eastern medicine because, I mean, it all starts from the internal, like the way we think, again, puts those filters up and then creates our life. So oh, us over here, it's like we have no time. So, of course, we think we have no time and we either don't work out or we go to these really intense workouts. 
that I don't see a lot of people happy from them. If you're happy with that, then cool. But I think the happiness factor, it's just like, yeah, I beat myself up. What are you beating yourself up for? Why do you need to beat yourself up? Like, <laughs> what is that? There's just such a different flip-flopped mindset. And so that's why I went to the, the Eastern medicine. It's just like, oh, cultivate from the inside. Like my whole thing with health is inner peace and happiness. So what's going to bring that for me? Not running five miles. I can promise you that. But some gentle movement, some walking. I mean, the thinnest I've ever been, I was just walking. So walking every night, enjoying my scenery. Sounds great. A lot easier. <laughs> a lot less damaging to your joints. One more topic and and then we can probably wrap because we could do more of these more often. And if any of you out there are listening and you're thinking, oh, what about this thing? Then just drop us a line to podcast.lotusway.com or you can write in through Sun Center, Phoenix, or Lotusway Instagram. And we'll start collecting all the questions so we can ask Kaya more regularly. But one that really comes to mind, I think that people really resonate with is digestive issues, tummy bloating, food sensitivities. I know being here in Asia, I've written about it on social media, you know, just kind of like having kind of a shit show with like, what do I eat? And taking a couple months to figure out with the various diets that are here, like, what are the things that are like bloating me up? And I wrote an email about that. And I think a lot of people can relate. So do you have any tips for digestive health and or figuring, you know, bloating or heaviness after meals or trying to figure out what's, you know, giving you reactions in your body or any sort of like herbal teas to drink to help soothe the tummy or any kind of tips you'd have for folks who are struggling with digestive issues? Yeah. So that, yeah, that's all individual, but generalizing, um, what are you doing? How do you feel about food? Are you like, for me, my, the way I healed my digestive issues was addressing the undigested emotions that I had had for years <laughs> and just couldn't, couldn't even go there, but. But you have clear things that you can and can't eat. Right? Yeah, for me, I definitely do. Like I have celiac disease, so I cannot have gluten. But I believe that was a trigger. Everything is triggered by an emotional experience. So for me, that was a stressful, stressful childhood. So but looking at looking at what are the things we're digesting in life? Yeah, looking at the what are what are you not digesting? What are you digesting? When you eat, are you watching TV? Are you thinking about stressful things? Are you go 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 go? the environment has a, has a big, has a big influence too. Like you're where it's hot and humid, you're from the desert. So that's going to mess with what you're able to eat a little differently. And just being in a whole different place will, will do that for you. And then are you chewing your food properly? Are you eating real food? Real food is stuff that grows without being processed. So or having minimal processed, like cane sugar, that's a super processed food versus maple syrup. You just kind of have to heat it up and that that's what makes it sweet. <laughs> there is just like so none of that here. <laughs> Which is so weird. I would think over there it would be like sugar. Not sugar everywhere. That's so strange. Sugar is so, so bad for the body. It just is. I mean, I get joint flare-ups if I have regular sugar versus like maple syrup unprocessed or processed sugar, white sugar. So it's, 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 it's like a, it's like a, it's a liquid sugar. It's like a clear, like, like um, juice? what is it like cane juice, cane sugar juice? Yeah. They just kind of scoop it into a drink and you, you can ask for less sugar. Like they're really good about, you know, there's a fruit juice shop and you can say no sugar or less sugar. Mm -hmm. Uh, with a lot of the desserts and juices, I just sort of like scoop this clear sugar liquid in. Do they see you're American? Just like, you're like here, you might want a lot of sugar. Have you noticed a no, difference? No, I don't think it has anything to do with okay. where I come from. It's just... Why are they eating so much sugar? I wonder what the health is over there. I think it's just like for desserts and juices, that's always been the way you make them. Ugh. But <laughs> yeah, I mean... Tonight we had bean curd and they put some kind of 
you know, that sugar, but it was from palm sugar, Gula Malacca, and it was perfect. It was like, great. It was kind of mm-hmm. this like old school shop and you could tell the sun was running it, you know, it's probably been in his family for a while. And so it was like really traditional recipes and they make it fresh every day, bean curd, like really soft tofu with a little bit of sweet stuff on top. And I was impressed because it was very low sugar. And I think the body is, when it's healthy, it's able to take in small quantities of stuff like that. But I think that we've just gotten, you know, over on the other extreme of loading in too much. But there's no like honey or maple syrup. I'm sure, I'm sure it's available here in stores, but it's just rare to see it added to drinks. Yeah. That's so strange. Yeah. And then here in America, we are uh, overthinkers. I don't know how it is over there. So sugar, overthinking and worrying will hurt the stomach and spleen. And then adding sugar on top of that will hurt hurt the digestive system even more. So it's like a double whammy for us. And again, I don't know culturally if they have the overthinking problem over there. Not as bad as the West. (laughs) We're we're kind of special in that aspect. We really get in our heads and we, we prize the analytical mind. So, (laughs) so adding sugar on top of that is just like a bomb what ready to go off. So I'll just like list some basic digestive stuff. So I don't have to sit here and ramble like a crazy person. So you want to make sure that you chew your food way more than you think. Amylase is in our saliva and that's what breaks down carbohydrates. So it's really good to chew your food. You want to make sure that you're not thinking stressful thoughts and you're focusing on what you're eating and you're not in a rush to eat. Take your time, enjoy it, savor it. Food should be enjoyed. If you're not enjoying your food, you got to reevaluate that. Teas with food versus ice water. Ice water is going to, yeah, it's going to inhibit your digestion. It's going to put out your digestive fire and mess with your blood flow versus like a tea. I think ginger tea is super great because ginger is really nourishing for the digestive system. So if you're sipping on that while you're eating, that's going to help you versus hurt you. And then breathing, make sure you're breathing. I feel like we're like shoving food in our mouth and like holding our breath and we don't really consciously breathe. So taking nice deep breaths and making sure that you're not overeating. Overeating is going to, it's just going to hurt your digestive system because I mean, nobody wants more work than they have to have, right? Do you like going out and doing extra work on top of your work? Neither does your stomach. <laughs> Don't overburden it. <laughs> I've seen so many people like, my food tastes so good. I just want to keep eating it. I'm like, well, you can, it'll taste good later too. Just take a little break. It's okay. Yeah. It's I've noticed that the, I've noticed that the Chinese doctors here are very, at least while you're taking herbs, very anti-cold drinks, like no cold drinks. Do you want to share why that's so important? E- you know, even it's like, well, it's summer, it's hot, people are hot, the cold drink will cool me down. Why can't I have cold drinks? Why is it so important to stay away from cold drinks? So overall, uh, you're your stomach in Chinese medicine is seen as like a fire, a digestive fire. And you always need to tend that fire. What happens if you put cold on fire and wet on fire is it kind of puts that out and slows things down. And think about what happens when you put ice on an area of your body, the blood vessels constrict and same thing with your stomach. It throws you out of homeostasis. So instead of, instead of cooling you down, it it does, you feel cooler but the body then has to warm everything back up to bring you back into homeostasis. So it actually is less helpful to drink ice water on a hot day. You want to actually drink something warm to cool you down, which is counterintuitive. And sometimes when it's like 120 here, like I'll reach for a cold drink because I just feel like I can't cool down. But generally speaking, it's not very helpful. And that leads me to one last question. And that is, do you advise against icing the body when there's an injury, do you advise warmth and why? So, yeah, this is a lot of people don't think this, but when you get injured, your body has a whole process that it goes through to heal itself and to protect itself. So, now, luckily, studies are supporting this that if you ice after an injury, you are going to slow down the healing. So, your body's sitting there trying to send all the little healers through your blood and you're throwing ice on it. And that is, I mean, that's just not even heard of in nature. 
you've seen animal go ice, it's like, <laughs> it's not a thing. And you're saying because it's constricting the blood vessels, not allowing blood to get to the area and the blood's what's carrying all the good stuff. Everything that heals it. And so after you bring the ice off, there's like eventually a, a rush of blood, but it's just, it's, it slows down healing. You're just not going to get the same healing response that you would if you don't ice. So I am, I'm not pro ice. There's a lot of these cryotherapy places that are popping up now, which is interesting and um we did the cold and the hot thing, huh? thing. <laughs> extreme 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 oh it's so extreme so i'm curious what happens long term i've heard that icing too much will cause the fat that's in your blood to thicken which makes sense like what happens when you put fat and oil in the fridge it gets really hard so if you're doing that all the time is it going to increase your risk of like a heart issue or stroke or a blockage I think that's something to really look into. I've heard too from 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 wise people that if you ice an injury, it will lock stuff into the bone. That's not helpful. Yeah, it pushes it further into the body. Is what is what our Chinese medicine way of thinking is. It'll push it further in where heat helps it pull it out. So like moxa, for instance, it's something that draws it out because you're getting the lymphatic system and the blood, the circulatory system activated. So it's going to increase the flow. And then you open up, ending, end up opening your pores and letting go of whatever issue it is. So as far as acute injuries, I don't do any, I just leave them alone. <laughs> Gentle movements. I do acupuncture, like when I sprain my ankle. Last year, I think it was, I just sat on the couch and I did my acupuncture and I took care of it that way, drank lots of water and, you know, didn't really, I did gentle movements when I could, as long as my body didn't get a strong, don't do that signal. But yeah, I don't heat it. I don't ice it. As far as chronic pain goes, what happens is when you've been in pain for a long point of time, the body thinks that area is like, has a big issue, which it does, and it'll actually reduce blood flow to the area. And then that's why you're not healing properly. So heat in that instance, I think is really good. I do use the infrared heat lamp in, in my practice and personally to help increase blood flow as well as acupuncture. I love it. And so warm and toasty. Yeah. Oh, and then uh, another thing for the joint pain stuff, if you guys have access to castor oil, castor oil, it's really, really helpful for pain. Doing packs or just rubbing it on? Rubbing it on, it'll work, but if you throw the pack on there, which is just the castor oil soaked wool with some heat, then you're going to get a better absorption because, again, it increases blood flow and opens up the pores. Nice. Can you think of anything else you really want to share that's, like, burning in your periphery right now? Like, like my whole thing is take your health into your own hands when you can. So, like, I love that you're over there and you're seeing these people's habits and what they're doing daily to really take care of themselves. And quit thinking that you don't have time or, you know, whatever your story is, quit, quit. <laughs> You're worth it. Like move, go for a walk, enjoy a nice glass of water, like whatever it is, just start doing one little thing every day to help your health because you, you just can't put it off for later. It doesn't work like that. You have to do daily actions to have a nice, healthy, happy life. It's just, yeah, don't put it off guys. <laughs> <laughs> And for any of you listening, make sure you check out the movement video that we just posted on YouTube. Some of those daily life activities are up there. Yeah, I mean, we're just not, none of us are getting any younger. It's no, it's, it's just gets, it just gets a little more challenging as you get older to stay balanced. So better to implement everything while we're young, right? And ensure your kids that a lot of people are like, well, I don't have time. I have a family. I'm not asking you to go to the gym for an hour. Like take your kid for a walk, show them what it is to be healthy every day. Show them that it's okay to take care of yourself. It's okay to sit and enjoy your food or drink your tea or water. Show them it's okay to like stretch out. I used to stretch out with my son when he was little, he'd crawl all over me. And then I do like little, what is it called? Push-ups or whatever. Where you, I would hold him and like put, put him up in the air. It's <laughs> And it was fun for him. So, you know, we can, we can always find a little bit of time. And even if it were sitting in the car, breathing is so important. Sit there and breathe. That's so important for your health, your lymphatic system, your circulation. There's all these little things. I'm not, I don't ever ask anybody to like go run five miles a day or anything like that. Do, 
actions that will add up throughout your entire life. Yeah, no, what did you tell me? Eat red meat and what else? A little bit of alcohol. <laughs> yeah, just a little bit. <laughs> and you're like, wait, what? <laughs> like, go eat a cow and drink a little bit of whiskey with that. It'll be fine. <laughs> Yeah, so we'll be doing these episodes more regularly with Kaya. I'm really excited about it to act as a resource. This is a free resource. Come and get it. Take advantage of it while it's here. I know if you come through Phoenix, Kaya is at the Sun Center and can make appointments. Or if you just want to take like a week off and come to Phoenix and get well and get um, a lot of extra personal attention Kai is available. And if not, stay tuned and keep listening to these podcasts. If you have specific health questions, we can tackle them and, you know, offer great free resources. So thanks for listening and thanks for joining us, Kaya. <laughs> Anytime. Thank you so much for listening to The Flower Lounge. I'm Katie Hess and we'll be releasing a new podcast every Wednesday. If you like what you heard or you know someone who might be touched by our conversation, share it with them. And don't forget to subscribe. To find out what your favorite flowers mean about you, take the quiz at lotusway.com.